20 for 20 long years. I smoke lots of reefer, drank lots of beer. Every day for 20, we're gonna sit on the score and for 20 long years. It's been 20 past four. Hey everybody, Jeff Kravitz, 420 Live. Welcome to Thursday. Thursday, I don't even know why we have names for days anymore. It just be called Day Day. Welcome to Day Day. Another day, another pandemic. Everybody's locked. We're locking back down. We see the numbers increasing. Ugh. Watching the news is so depressing. That's why we're here, because we don't want to watch the news. Thank you for turning into our diversion, our distraction. I'm excited today. We have Ethan Miller from Hal and Rain coming on the show to talk about his music and to, to take us away from having to. That's why we started the show, because I didn't want to focus on what was going on out there. And it's been hard not to focus because it is so exciting. I mean, watching CNN is like watching a soap opera. It's like, oh, let's catch up. Who's got COVID today? Oh, Corey Lindowski. <laughs> Six people that went to the um, went to the celebration party on election night, I guess, whatever you wanted to call it, at the White House, came down with the disease. It's great. It's, it's amazing when you just go infect your whole team. And, you know, as far as the coup, the only coup is we're coming back. We're bringing the fun back, folks. We're bringing the fun back. We're kicking it up to the next level. We're not taking this line down anymore. It's time to... Uh, I don't know what it's time for. I, I mean, I want to do so many things, but I'm, I mean, I, I, my, my budget is, uh, I want to go to Cos Costa Rica, but my budget's Costco Rica. Like that for entertainment, I go to Costco and walk around the aisles and look at all the other people shopping and put my mask on and see what they got in their basket. <laughs> that, that's what it's come to. No movies, no concerts, no fun. I mean, there are limited things going on in LA. We have the backyard concerts going on. There's been a lot of fun. Uh, you know, safe. Everybody's tested. There's a huge market for uh, black market tests out there. You want to test your friends and make sure everybody's uh, copacetic. You know, we want to get on with our uh, our lives. We want, we do. I can feel it. But I think there's going to be a little bit of locking down first because, yeah, obviously, whatever uh, our president's, uh, you know, course of action is for this, his strategy as so to, I mean, I don't even think there is a strategy, but his strategy, so to speak, is uh, not really that effective. It's been effective in spreading COVID, so he's done a great job. Uh, the whole country's uh, a mess. But, and, you know, still counting. We're counting. We're recounting. We're don't count, but count. Don't count, but count. It's unbelievable out there. You know, it's fun. I'm, I'm happy to be witnessing this history. You know, if this if I wasn't here on the planet to watch this high drama, I don't know how I would survive. It's kept me going, you know, day to day, putting on CNN and seeing where we are in the soap opera. Yesterday, in as your world turns, the only problem is this is real. It's not a fantasy. It, as much as we like to think that these are all characters in some great Game of Thrones reboot, <laughs> Game of Thrones, the modern era. Uh Truth is stranger than fiction. Let's face it. I, you know, when I had Stuart Copeland on the show, one thing he said was, who would have thought that all the science fiction, all the great thinkers, nobody had a shortage of toilet paper on their pandemic or on their what's going to happen in the future? What's going to happen in the future? People are not going to be able to wipe their butts. <laughs> and that to me, that's a shitty future. And OK, I'm sorry. The dad jokes, the puns, you know, absolutely why I'm here. Absolutely why I'm here. But I'm also here to talk about amazing talent and to talk with amazing talent. We've had an amazing week so far. Yesterday, we were talking hockey. I don't know if you saw us talking to, to two NHL greats yesterday, but talking about cannabis with hockey players, you would think would be like off limits. Like, oh, I can't talk about these guys. These guys are like, yeah, I got stoned every day in the NHL. I was like, what? But this is medicine. This is what people use to get through. It, it's fueled our lifestyle. It's why I'm here at 420. It's fueled my lifestyle. Kept One thing that's kept me sane is uh, the legal weed, although overpriced legal weed. Anyway, our guest today, Ethan Miller, Hal and Rain, explosive band. The first time I heard him pop out on Jam On, I was like, who the hell is this? And what are they doing on Jam On? Because this is not no hippie music. These guys are shredding it and killing it. So I was excited to see uh, my friend Kevin Calabro uh, 
put out a press release about Ethan's new record. And I was like, I want to have Ethan on the show. So here he is. Let's welcome Ethan Miller to the show. Hi, Ethan. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Hey, everybody. Good. How are you doing? I'm doing very good. Thank you. I'm hanging in. Yes. Uh, you're. Uh, we talked to, before the show. You're up in Humboldt. How's everything up there? It's pretty good. It's very peaceful. It's nice. And uh, forecast was for rain, but we got sun anyway. So hard to complain. And it, is everybody kind of locked down there? How's everybody behaving in town? Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's, um, people are behaving very good. Uh, as far as I can tell out on the streets, you know, everybody's got a mask and, you know, there's a little more room for everybody here. So I think it makes the, the friction, um, you know, and, and the dance of, of, uh, what you got to do in the city, you know, it's a, it's a little easier in this case. And it doesn't seem to have been overtly politicized here. It was sort of like, yeah, we've got a problem. Let's, let's get through it and work through it the best we can. So that's pretty ideal in this. Well, it's, it's very bucolic out there and, and open. Like you said, there's a lot of space. How did you end up in Humboldt? Well, I grew up, I was born and raised in Humboldt and so was my wife. And um, we actually just moved back here. Um, so I've been in Oakland for the last 20 years and I spent my first, uh, 20 or so years or 18 years in up, up here in Humboldt. So I've got family here and friends and, um, kind of a natural progression back after, uh, after some time in the Bay area, a couple of decades. Well, legendary tri County. I mean, that's famous. When I was back at the East, we would hear about Humboldt County having the best bud in the country. And sure enough, it- <laughs> And, you know, it was a cottage industry there before it was. I like That's kind of where the California industry grew was kind of in humble. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's it, I mean, I think interesting things happen. I don't know the whole depth of the story. I'm not sure if anyone knows exactly where it stands um, between the overground and underground since it, since legalization. You know, it's kind of a complicated move after. Yeah. After some of the birth of marijuana cultivation and, and, you know, major underground export for the last, what are we talking? Five decades or so. Yeah. I mean, the number one cash crop in California for decades. Sure. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not sure if it's kept up, you know, if it's been quite as on top of the legalization thing as, as some of the other places, Washington, Colorado, you know, I don't know if the growing pains of that evened out or, or are you, are you talking about the cut, the, the businesses in Humboldt that went above ground and legitimate? Yeah. That, that the idea that, after, you know, you would think that the, the, the county that had, you know, really pioneered the whole thing, you know, that once it went legal, they'd be primed to just say, oh, okay, just turn the light switch on and let the legal gold flow in on the gold rush. But you know, I'm not sure if it was that simple. Or not. No. Well, I think the problem is that they taxed everything so hard that everything's up 30%. When you go buy it in the shop, you look at it, something that's going to cost uh, 30 bucks and it's going to cost you 40 bucks when you get out the door. So that's uh, so. that's not good math. Like I, sm- I smoke quite a bit and I like to, you know, I don't want to, I like to keep my cost ratio down because otherwise my wife will be like, honey, what the, you're spending all, all our food money on weed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the old days. <laughs> Just like the old days. It's kind of it's kind of crazy. Um, let's talk a little bit about the music because I really enjoyed the record. You're doing a series of, of live records. I, I take it. I, I was reading a couple of interviews, and you're modeling this after the Dick's Pick series, which kudos because one of my favorite live series. Well, I mean, before Dick's Picks, we, we would get live records, and everything it would be like, oh, even Fish a live one, like that was the their official live release, which a lot of bands overdubbed. Uh, they worked on, uh, you know, the tracks to make sure it sounded perfect. This warts and all philosophy really started with like Dick's picks, I think, right? It seems like it. I mean, warts and all kind of seems like, yeah, that's just so dead at its core. You know, that they that maybe with all the big taper culture, it just was by the time that they really were releasing a lot of live stuff. They're like, this is so out of hand. There's so much music out there that why, why do we even need to edit or worry about this? You know, the, the people have spoken and, and um, we can't really quality control much anymore. We can just pick our favorite shows and put them out. And I, I really like that model. I'm, you know, I'm not saying that I subscribe to that, form of complete unediting obviously the first two of these live records that i did were compilations 
um, in some ways they were kind of supposed to be more like that live from the fill zone dead thing where you, right. Where you went, you picked the best tracks that you, that worked or, or yeah, best or, you know, interesting or unique or whatever. Cause even on the, the fill zone, some of those you're like, this may not be the best of the song, but it's a very unique and interesting version of it. And you don't hear something somewhere else. And I, I wanted to try to, you know, do that kind of thing with the live series. I mean, if you plan on doing a live series that, extends indefinitely like dick's picks or a, a dead type thing it frees you up not to have to make you know the greatest you know live album you know totally polished of all time you can say yeah warts and all and even this strange version that we only did once of this this is a perfect place for it you know people will come come back and keep visiting and and you know it's kind of it's a deep deep dive for fans you know not a not a, a huge wide net, you know, that's trying to, you know, give a the most sensational polished first look at a band or something. You know? I'm trying to think what the first live record I owned was. I kind of think it was Kiss Alive. <laughs> Which <laughs> quite questionable as to whether <laughs> there is much uh, live great record. Though. I won't, I would, would not. Uh, I mean, that's the thing I love about these live records is, you know, you got a Thin Lizzy live and dangerous, a Bob Seger live bullet, a uh, uh, a Kiss alive, and even if they've gone back and stripped it down to the hi hats and over read overdubbed everything, it could still be your favorite live album. And they still figured out how to tell the truth about the experience of a Kiss concert because maybe Warts and All doesn't feel like it feels to be with thirty thousand people screaming while Gene Simmons spits blood on you. You don't. Know. <laughs> small mistakes in the playing or if the, you know, if the vocals are a little funky or you, you want to feel larger than life that this crazy mythical cartoon godlike thing. And I, I well, and of course, and that record came out in like 78, 79, like around then, or maybe even a little bit earlier, 77. And it was, uh, in those days, they didn't really release warts and all. They, everything went through the polish because it was the record label that was putting it out. The, the, that was when we were playing the record label game, you know, as yeah. a, a, the only way of life for a musician. And that's something I wanted to ask you because you did that for a while too. You tried to play that record la label game. What was the biggest obstacles that you found trying to, to work in that, in that freaking crazy-ass world that doesn't really work? Well... I, I've, I have to say, at this point, I've had all kinds of experience with record labels. Some of my early, and I've always been pretty lucky, even in the major label experience. I mean, I wouldn't call the, the outcome of that or the moment in, in history. At, you know, I got signed to a major label and Helen Rains began to work with a major label to release records, you know, on the on the very cliff of the edge of the old paradigm of the record industry, just as, as those majors were just slipping off of it, you know, I mean, in the time that I was at American and, and, and Columbia was the parent company, you know, they were going through presidents and AR guys and whatever, just, you know, shuffling through. I mean, I actually <laughs> outlasted a lot of <laughs> and employees there in my three years or whatever it was that I was on the label um, because it was an extremely quicksand moment. And I think nobody knew what was happening, least of all, you know, people under a lot of pressure that were trying to come out of the end of an old major label paradigm and understand what the future was going to be. Well, they, they couldn't. That was part of the problem is instead of embracing Napster, they sued them. And when they, what they should have done is bought them and, and use them to, for their devices. And it would have been brilliant, but they didn't want, they wanted to try to put every, the genie back in the bottle. And I think that's what yeah. bit him in the ass. And, 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 you know, in that moment too, there's, there's not a lot of patience for you, know, you bring in some new guru, you bring in some new, employee and say you know work in the new paradigm show us magic we don't know what's going on we've hired you to do it and in you know four months they're feeling desperate and if you still haven't performed you know you don't get three years to try to it's like make it happen it didn't happen go on bring in the next one and it's kind of like henry the eighth with his wives or something and all put their heads yeah, bring them in you know no this doesn't work like hey you've only been married for five minutes here give somebody time to envision so, so all that's to say that um you know, I, I, I don't know. I've always been fairly lucky on a personal level 
with the people that I worked with in record labels, from indie labels to one one person run DIY labels to all the way up to major labels and, and Rick Rubin's American, at least on a personal level, you know, I was never I was never ripped off. I never had horrible experiences, and I always, you know, they were they were based on relationships, and that was the positive from from all my experiences over the last two decades that I tried to take with me as I started to form my own ideas about how to release music myself and be my own label. The negatives, I thought, most of all, the most important thing was, you know, I, I couldn't, I, I realized after American and after working with, one of the things I think that working with Rick Rubin taught me was that even though you have this mythical producer guru, on the other end of that, I was like, nobody knows how I want to do this and how I'm supposed to be doing it. Like I know, you know, and maybe that's just the type of artist I am because I know some artists do work with a producer in, you know, this producer, that producer, Rick Rubin, whoever, and they say, wow, he, he or she really brought these things out of me um, that I didn't know were there. But I don't know, maybe I'm too hard headed or <laughs> I just well, have no, no, you have the vision, though. If you have the singular vision and you understand how you want the end product to sound, then you have to be the one that's creating the uh, the the uh, you have to be producing yourself. Right. Is that what you learned? And that extends. Exactly. And, and you know, I guess just the confidence to say, hey, this isn't really rocket science. You you win some, you lose some. Sometimes you make the right decision. Sometimes you make the least, but you you move forward. You can move by your own timeline that you're comfortable with. You don't have to work by some other labels. You know, you get a, a label with 40 people on staff and then parent companies that are making money decisions. So your timeline shifts drastically. I make decisions at 6 a.m. or the middle of the night and things can happen. It's, the decision is done and the next day the manufacturing plant can start pressing records or sending me proofs. And, you know, all the way down to the way that I want the product to look, I started realizing in a lot of instances, I'm, you know, kind of micromanaging and sending this information on to labels. You know, all that's missing is just, you know, I'm already putting the time in. I think, you know, at some point I was like, I think I know how to do most of this stuff now, you know. Well, what's, your what's your metric to judge your success? Because in the old days, it would be, you know, uh, how it charted. Right. It would be like, where am I on the charts? Which is there's still charts. Well, yeah. And that that, you know, I, I think for everybody, because of the way that the, the new paradigm that's emerging looks that, you know, we've dialed that back a bit. Sure. If major labels release an Adele record, they still want to see like, Hey, we sold, you know, 3 million last time. We want to see, you know, 2.8 to 3.5 million to call it good here. It's going to be a flop. It's this, that, but I think, you know, even with most releases on most labels, they're counting record sales by the thousands. And, and what they want to see is, you know, some of that energy in, in, in its retail, some of the energy and its social media surroundings that the bands do, some of the energy, you know, just that fan energy, like they're latching on and, and things are happening. So, you know, I think it's gone a little bit from cold, hard numbers, you know, on a grand scale at most labels to like, let, let's see if we can find that energy. And then you figure out ways to, you know, to make it work. Um, financially, there are different ways that, you know, some money can come back in to make the to make the thing happen, be it record sales or. You well, know, you, you don't have the live shows now, right? Have you been doing any streams or anything like that? Have I done any yet? Any streams or no. any uh, live uh, How and Rain streams or anything on, in that vein? You know, I, I haven't yet because one of the things that's been a little tricky is my band uh, is in Los Angeles and San Diego and I was in the Bay Area and then, you know, moving up to making the move up to Humboldt. So um, things have been a little, uh, even a little more logistically tricky to get that together for me. But um, yeah, I will say, I, I know a lot of uh, friends of love doing it and, and, you know, from small to, to big scale have, have found it to be, you know, a lucrative thing that you could do um, to an extent during, during COVID. It's difficult. Obviously this is not as good as 
going out to clubs and being able to hit a different one every night and hit the. No, would you, and then I saw I was reading an interview that you did in February just before the shit hit the fan, and one of the things that it said is you did like twenty two gigs in nineteen days or something like that. Is that right? Did I read that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We like to stack them up. I mean, the band was was. I, I hope this comes across on the two live records, the recent under the wheels live records, but. You know, this particular band got to the point that, um, you know, every all, all four of us in the band loved music and we found that or loved playing the music live and and being up there most, you know, that we didn't feel like it was much of a recoup to take a day off and sit around in the uh, travel lodge, you know, doing looking at the laptop or whatever it is that you do that, um you know, we wanted to, we're like, hey, we just missed another two hours of set time tonight and a little more money and seeing friends and, and free right. Drink. You're paying to be on the road, but you're not working. And and it's better to be out every night work. But 22 gigs in 19 days, it sounds like a jazz fest, fest uh, schedule. Is is that where you picked the uh, material for the new record from that from those gigs? I, I believe that that tour where where we did the, the a couple shows and in, in 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 one day more than once which gave us the uh, the higher number than days in the tour was um, I believe that yes that the New York show at the end that's a little over adrenalized we <laughs> were a little fast and intense on on the New York Union Pool shows um, songs that got picked for under the wheels. Those are at the end of that one. Yeah, we came in, we came in hot and and didn't really hit the brakes. We just kind of hit the wall at the end of the set and went, all right, that's it. Onto the plane the next morning at dawn, and that tour is done. You know. Yeah, well, it's a lot of energy you expended in a short amount of time, but you got amazing stuff out of it. The album's really engaging. The live, your improv. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the two guitars because I think that that's really unique. I don't see too many two guitar bands these days. How? What, what's your inspiration? And I was sitting here trying to think about four piece bands with two guitars in them, and I, I, I I'm coming up. I want to say like I don't know. I without keys because you don't have keys, right? No, no, we don't have keys in this lineup. Um, I mean, I think Thin Lizzy, you know, is is an obvious for you know for that more kind of like written guitar mini kind of dual guitar work. It is a is a quick you know notation for a four man band with two guitarists that you know that they really showcase that dual guitar stuff. But Dan and I, I, I have a a I have a fondness for the guitars ever since the alligator bride record which is the last studio record that this band did right before these live records um for them not, not all the guitar the dueling guitar stuff to be like written out in harmony you know like like that that there's this thing i was chasing where the guitars are kind of in a bit of chaos it sort of sounds like um you're in the studio and 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 you you know when you record four guitar solos and then you're going to pick one of them or comp them together. But at some point, the engineer puts all four up at once and they're sort of doing things that were of the same mindset, but they're not the same. And they're kind of a tangle, but they're a little bit melodic and they're also a little dissonant and sort of sounds like a tangle of electricity a little bit, but it's kind of beautiful. Um, that that was sort of my vision for that I kept pushing Dan and I to, to do, to try to find this sort of Jackson Pollock telepathy with the guitar intertwining well, that, that the your middle track the 14 minute it's called lightning is that what it's called called lightning too lightning yeah holy right. crap i literally had to get up out of my seat to see what the name of the song was when i was i was like what the hell is this tune because you guys are just going for it the two of you i mean i can't tell who's doing what and is there pedal steel or am i is that just all slide that's bottleneck slide that dan does yeah he's just a, a, a an a fantastic slide player and he does play pedal steel too so i think that's where he brings some of that back in when he uses the volume pedal and the, and does, the he re pedal. does he record with the pedal steel is that on the um on alligator bride or there is a little bit of pedal steel um like on the song speed that's got pedal steel uh in the slow parts and uh i'd say these days most of what you'll hear dan doing is is you know traditional electric six string bottleneck blues slide but um yeah he does the he does a beautiful pedal steel too and he plays in a couple 
country bands and, and does a real beautiful rendition. So yeah, the, the combination is really intriguing and it's just, uh, uh, just really energetic. I mean, I, and that was what the thing I said in the intro when I first heard you guys on jam on years ago. And I, I was like, what is this band doing on jam on and who the hell are they? <laughs> I mean, almost, I think white denim is another band that I would say is a uh, rocking. Yeah. Uh, and out around the same time, and maybe they're a little bit younger than you guys, I think. But they also have that same kind of rocking. But it's a it's jam. I mean, you guys are going for the improv. Yeah, I think I think when it all boils down to the, the you know the the really what you might call more you know truer jam bands that fit into the you know fit into that cubby hole a little more traditionally. And a band like White Den Denim or Helen Rain, probably that source material that we all love, you know, is coming back to similar stuff, you know, that came out of the 60s, 70s and 80s. It may be that, you know, where uh, White Denim and Helen Rain veer off a little more is maybe we are of an age to also be influenced by, you know, 80s punk music new wave and then, you know, eighties and nineties indie music, um, you know, that, that, uh, comes back into play a little bit. Um, but I think a lot of that foundational music of, you know, sixties and seventies classic and, and sort of underground, you know, lost gems and rock music, that's pretty foundational stuff or, you know, Zappa or the Velvet Underground. I mean, be it, you know, Fish or, Helen Rain, everybody's going to look back to some of these great pioneers, you know, and then it's just sort of a matter of technique after that, I think. You know, I think Alligator Bride sounds like a Neil Young song when it first starts. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that definitely was an homage to, to Neil and Crazy Horse, especially Crazy Horse, because sometimes Neil's got his pro backing musicians. And, you know, when we got that, it was supposed to be like kind of a late night campfire song that I brought into the guys and said, Oh, you know, I got this tune. Maybe we'll, maybe I'll just do it in the studio late night after everybody's, you know, off having a beer or something after the session. And, and we'll see, you know, maybe put it last on the record or something. And Dan, the other guitarist said, you know, Oh, I, I want to try it, you know, as a rock arrangement. I think the band could really sink in their teeth and, and we tried it. It sounded pretty good. And, and I think, you know, I said, I think we take it one step further and really give it that sort of late seventies, eighties, crazy horse caveman stomp. Where yeah, I mean, it almost has like a powder finger kind of vibe. That exactly. opening lick is just like so reminiscent of so many great opening rock and roll licks that lead you into the song, which you don't hear a lot anymore. You know, it's, it's amazing. And 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 sort of tech, you know, tech, all the technicalities gone out of it. I, you know, when we strike a chord in that song. It's just, you know, hit it, let it ring, you know, let it do its thing. When the drums strike a, a tom roll, there's no fancy, you know, it's just make it sound like you're, you know, hitting a board against the wall three times every time. But that's what Crazy Horse does. When they hit the ride, it's not, you know, it's not Bernard Purdy. It's ding, 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 you know, and, and I just think nobody quite does that. Well, a lot of garage, you know, a lot of bands do that, but nobody can do it as brilliantly as Crazy Horse. And so in its way, um, you know, that was our challenge was to try to, you know, take, you know, take it back to this, just, just an emotion, you know, just a caveman delivery, you know, that could still be full of grace. Well, you don't, uh, sometimes the, uh, sometimes shit's overplayed, especially nowadays because everybody feels like they got to do some fancy and, you know, show their technique and stuff like that. And it, it's simpler things are what resonate. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I think I bridge a gap a little bit between, you know, not obviously, yeah, you, a lot of virtuosic musicians, you can't ask them to do that. Like, hey, dumb it down. Pretend like you barely know how to play the drums. <laughs> you can't do that. You know, they're just like, they're not, it's not in their DNA. But I also can't, you know, my initial forays into music were, were through punk. So I can, and I do know that, you know, I'm not a virtuoso. Um, you know, I express myself through my ideas and my ambition and my willpower and my creativity. And, but I also love to play with virtuosic musicians and, and, 
and I often surround myself with them and Alan Rain. So I, I like to try to, you know, bridge a gap and try to make those things come together that don't, you know, don't always come together and, you know, not, not comparing myself to him, but Neil Young obviously loved to do that too, you know? To, to yeah. Well, he, I, I don't consider him a virtuoso when it comes to guitar no. playing or Neil. No, no, it's about his spirit and his creativity and, and his, his style. He has a very unique style and approach and his songwriting is just unbelievable. I think everybody's different. And, and by the way, happy birthday to Neil 75 today. Happy birthday, Neil. I know he's watching right now. <laughs> 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 Love you, he doesn't have he doesn't have much to do. Um, and I also read that you're like a one guitar guy. What do you mean? Did I only play one guitar? Yeah, that you have like one one guitar that's your main axe that you want to that you play at every show, and that's kind of like what you play. That is kind of true. I bought a 1964 Fender Jaguar from Steve's Music World in Santa Cruz for like I think it was under fourteen hundred dollars, and it was um, like seafoam green, and it it had some use. This obviously, even when I bought it in nineteen ninety nine, um, it it was something you could see. Like this thing's been played almost every day for the last you know uh, forty years or whatever, thirty years then. Um, and I have loved that guitar so deeply ever since. I played a lot of different guitars in Helen Rain, but I came back to it partly because I'm a big whammy bar and tremolo player um and there isn't another guitar in the world that seems to you know stay relatively in tune and react quite as well uh to the whammy bar as this particular jaguar so well, the jaguars did they have whammy bars or was that like an add-on no they, they had them they were i think the jaguars were made for surf music it's like the classic offset body and the and the whammy bars were they were the 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 ventures guitar you know? right and, and I, that, kurt cobain that's what yeah it's a jaguar isn't it he yeah he played jaguars jazz masters and mustangs and all those sort of what then were were considered you know b and c level fender guitars and as soon as he did it they were considered very expensive <laughs> guitars again. Yeah, you really didn't see too many people playing them before Kurt. Yeah, not a ton. I mean, you know, Sonic Youth and and some, but especially those Mustangs and some of those, they were just giving them away. Yeah, know? I actually think that's a Mustang back there. I think they're you're all, right. They're all nice. They've got they've got interesting whammy bars too. But and I had one for this Jaguar. But I, I I was working at a pizza place and finishing up college when I got this. So. Fourteen hundred dollars might as well have been, you know, half a million. I had to sell some guitars and really. Well, that, that that's a lot of forethought back in those days to be like, this is the axe. I love the way it sounded. I honestly didn't really know if it was, you know, worth that or not. I just took it into a room and cranked it up in, in the back of this dark, vintage guitar palace cave, and played it for an hour and a half. And and I was like, there, there's my life for guitar. Thank you. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get this and. Maybe I'm overpaying. Maybe I'm underpaying. You know, immediately. People, well, now it's probably worth a lot more than that. Yeah, people have been offering me money for it ever since. But once you find your life, your life guitar, you know, you're just like it's, 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 there's there's not too many guys that played one axe. Jerry, you know, he he would have one axe that he would lock on to for a bunch of years. But he went through them. I mean, but he's Tiger. He played for years and Bold at the end and Rosebud and uh, Wolf. I mean, and he had the Travis Bean for a while. I mean, he was all over the place. Trey has only played the Languedoc. Um, you know, he probably has a half a dozen of those. But other than that, Hendrix, he had a bunch of strats, right, back in the day? Oh, I think so, you know. Yeah, I think, I don't know, some some of us, if it works, it's just like I I don't need much. You know, when you go in the studio and you try different things, because sometimes your favorite guitar that does everything for you, you get it in there and you're like, man, it just won't do it for the machines, you know. and you pull down some type of guitar you've never used before and you're like, ah, oh, that's exactly right. You know, that's, that sounds good. But um, live, it's nice to know what it's about to do, hopefully. You yeah. Know? And I don't think I, when you're playing a show, you know, I, when I see guys change guitars, like when I see Jack Johnson change the guitars with the lighting rig, Oh, it's going to be red. Get the red <laughs> guitar. <laughs> or uh, who else is as big on uh Oh, Radiohead. Like they're always changing gear. Every song, all the roadies right. are out 
bringing stuff on stage. And I get it because all the songs are different. They're written in different eras and they had different instrumentation and stuff like that. But it's just like, like when someone's up there and just holding the same ax all night, just digging in. I mean, I feel like you're, you're working, like you're shoveling, you got your tool and you're going to town. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I, I, uh, Maybe maybe when I get a guitar tech, I'll I'll get all the other guitars. You know, I have some other beautiful guitars that I really like. Um, but yeah, you know, part of it is is too is that um, you know I used to take more on tour, but you know the smaller vehicle you can get and the and the less that you have in there, and it's just less to get stolen. It's less to lose backstage, and it's and it's more merch you can fit into the vehicle, and and. Uh, you know, more money you can earn on tour. So I'm kind of like, ah, do I need four? Yeah, do I need to keep changing it? Just so I can sort of, ah, I like the way this Telecaster sounds a little bit on this song. I'm like, ah, Dan brings a bunch of guitars. He does all the guitar changing and we get all those different tones. And I, I uh, <laughs> you know, I just do my Jaguar. For my it's good and a lot easier and you don't got to, it's a lot easier to take care of, pull one guitar oh, yeah. out of the van at night. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you play a lot of, uh, theaters. I mean, How and Rain is a theater uh, theater band. You're you're not an arena band yet, right? No, no, no. We're 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 clubs. Once in a while, we get the odd uh, theater thing or something like that, you know. But most mostly, we're yeah, we're clubs. And next week, I'm having the guys on for the national uh, the national independent theater owners. Nito are coming on the show, and uh, they're going through a really hard time right now. This is your bread and butter. This whole market in America yeah. where these clubs exist. Yeah. What's your feeling on this? I I don't know. I mean, this is a complicated moment for, you know, I feel like the artists have ways to do this, but, uh, you know, to get through COVID and it's not easy, but at least we have the blessing of, of online. You know, you can sell your records, you can go on. And I don't know what the answer is to people that are paying enormous rents for these, you know, entertainment spaces um, or what the outcome is going to be. Uh, hopefully, yeah, government relief would be nice. People can do what they can. I don't, I do not know what the answer is to that, especially if, you know, I don't, I don't want to be a doomsayer, but, you know, I think we all look to think, well, maybe in three months we'll be back out of this and, and touring will begin again. But you know, we've got that every three month increment until here we are and we're nowhere close to getting on the other well, side. Well, because, because we had no consensus in the United States, we have leadership at the top that is dropping the ball and not even interested in addressing it. And now has let it run rampant in our country where places like Australia and New Zealand that shut down for four to eight, 10 weeks, they had a result at the end of it where it was tamped down to nothing. Even New York City this summer you know, they did an amazing job of getting the numbers down and now they're starting to inch back up. But I just think that we need to have do one thing, everybody on the same page in our country, because we can't have half the country open. Like I have friends in Miami that are going out to the clubs right. they're packed, and, and everything's life's on Nashville. If you walk down Broadway, it's going off. California is not like that. I mean, my son told me he's in San Diego and they had indoor dining. And today he said he went out for Korean barbecue last night because they're about to shut it all back down. So I think we're about to to start closing up a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I think San Francisco just started retracting the outdoor dining, and yeah, you're right. I mean, you know, what would you? It's just like, what what do you uh, expect to do when one state does one thing and one state does the other? And let's face it, we're you know we flow in the modern era. It's not unusual to flow through states to fly from one side of the country to the other. And even if we're not supposed to be doing that, people are doing it for work. And there's different lines of thought. You know, your your leadership in California may tell you, um, you know, don't go flying around for fun right now. Don't go on vacation right now. You know, don't, don't go out to the parks and stuff. Just stay home and sit this out. And in another state, they may tell you, go do anything you want. I'm not telling you, you can't, you don't even have to wear a mask. And some of the leaders are even saying, <laughs> some of the governors, but uh, it's probably just all a hoax anyway. So don't worry about it. In our state, we live free, you know, and it's a little bit, um, yeah, you wonder when you try to eradicate, you know, a mosquito infestation in your, in your swamp and, and you just, 40% of it, it, you might as well do none, you know, <laughs> or all of them, but um, we're still going to get bit here and, and we're having a big, big trouble. So, 
Yeah, we, we, we need to all come together on the same page. Fortunately, it looks like the leadership's going that way now with uh, the new leadership that's coming in. But we still have seven, eight, nine, ten weeks before he's in. So that's a lot of time to like, you yeah. know, we could be handling things and getting it on, on the same page. It's unfortunate. It affects the theater owners. It affects your way of making a living. I mean, you make most of your money on the road, right? That's that's kind of where the, the money comes from. Yeah, certainly for the band. I mean, and, and all kinds of things come from being on the road. I mean, being a label owner now, when I put out, I, I my friends that I used to be in bands with that worked at the distribution company that distributes Silver Current Records, my record label now, he used to tell me, I can see, you know, he could see when a band went on tour at the distribution company, they saw records sell. Just the band being out there and create, I mean, this is probably a no brainer to most of us, but in some ways it was shocking to see how exactly it lined up the day a band goes on tour. Um, you know, records start to sell record shops start to order the records. There's, there's online energy about the band almost to the day that they come off tour, those things, you know, dip down and the energy heads off to someone else that's out there making the noise and doing that. So it's not just about earning money from the club or merch sales from the club. You, you know, you go out, it's, it's, and it grows your brand. It grows your entire brand by being on the road. It creates the energy that comes all the way back to the distributorship, all the way to the you know record stores and 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 the people that are ordering records for stock, all the way to the yeah people whose friends just saw you and told you about them, and they go online and order a record. I mean, the whole thing is built around it. And we've been a little lucky during COVID because fans have been stuck in their homes and wanting music desperately. So they've gone online to order it and they've been very attentive to, uh, you know, the idea that the artists that they love, you know, if this goes on for two or three years, a lot of them could go away, you know, that, it, that, that without patronage and support and keeping an eye on that and, and keeping, you know, keeping that business going with them, that it's going to be an incredibly different landscape, you know, on the other side of this. And it's going to be anyways, but I think that goodwill and patronage and, and fans being very, you know, very supportive and faithful to the artists that they love has helped. It's harder to do that with the venues. I mean, let's, you know, face it. Yeah. You're not going to pay the rent for us. So you're getting nothing out of it. So it's not like you're at least with the artists, you give them money, you're going to get some music out of it or a t-shirt or something that you can have for your to hold, but to, to keep sending money to music venues so that they can pay the rent, you know, that you're, you're like, Oh, well, what is that getting me? I'm not really getting any kind of entertainment value out of it. I know Tipitina's is doing a huge show. I'm having the guys from tips on tomorrow to talk. They're saving tips this weekend. They're having a big fundraiser. And I think that's what's going to happen. We're seeing a lot of these clubs and a lot of these places saving, uh, trying to save themselves. Um, you're speaking of records, your last record's three years old. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> how, how, and you know, between every three years, they say that's good, good for kids too. Like three years, you got something new in the works. Yes, actually, uh, just had the new album mastered yesterday. So things are on the move. Um, and originally I envisioned this new, we went in and basically recorded a really stuffed to the gills double album, like epic double album that even might've been like, oh man, I think we have two and a half albums here. But like, I think I could get away with having it be not quite a rock opera or concept record, but this kind of flowing, you know, the songs wouldn't, would be a normal song, uh, you know, format. Some of them would be longer, some would be shorter. Um, but it would feel a little bit like song cycles or, or, or a single long, you know, epic journey. Um, and then when COVID hit, I, you know, touring was funding a lot of that larger scale, <laughs> grander vision. Yeah. You know, record, this is going to, we'll, we'll record two and a half hours of, of quality music. <laughs> you know, but I was like, okay, we've got a beautiful first record. Um, maybe we'll put them out, you know, one volume, then the second, maybe I can repackage them at, when the second one comes out into a double volume or triple volume thing so that they come back to that one, you know, one big piece. But um, for practical reasons and, 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 
you know, just so we <laughs> have something to do every every three, you know, every couple quarters in, in COVID, we'll, we'll break. Well, yeah, I think, I think it's better to hold the music now and not release that much because it's a little bit too much to lay on people like to do a double record. And now, you know, I talked to this with all my guests. It's the TikTok generation and we're not. I know you're not, I'm not. Maybe we should be because we'd probably be very entertaining on that format. I mean, the guy that got famous for riding a skateboard and drinking cranberry spray out of a container. I mean, if my mom saw me drinking out of the container, she'd smack me across the head. She'd be like, get a glass. But he, he became famous and now he's on ads. I saw him with an ad for Snoop Dogg yesterday. I'm like, this guy's like an, an advertising mecca. I mean, it's so weird. Like we are creating talent out of nothing. Seven out of the 10 songs in the top 10 charts, not that that's your market, but are from TikTok videos. And they start wow. off as 20 minute, 20 second or 30 second clips that they end up having to write a whole song to because everybody's like, oh, I love this. You know, it's, it's almost like the putting the horse before the car. I don't even know what, this is like putting the car before the horse. You know, it's like, it's, so backwards our whole world the way we consume music the way it charts the way it gets in front of the the public and becomes popular it's so backwards and, and we're all working off this paradigm you as a musician that's been doing this for many years and many other people of trying to fit what we've done in this new paradigm and it's kind of like oh you know you, yeah so i'm asking are you doing any tiktok videos <laughs> <laughs> to be honest i I'm not a I'm not a Luddite. Uh, you know, I, I I I believe in the power of of social media. Now that I run a record label, I I can see it. You know, you can see all these things. You're like, oh, social media posts, sales, engagement with fans. You know, a deeper relationship with fans. That that's the beauty of social media. But um, I also, you know, I'm I'm 43 years old, and and I have a whole lot of life and things to do every day, and it is really hard to keep up with that stuff. And it, it really, if you want to be peak social media, it's kind of got to be your life. You know, your whole job, your whole day. You you answer everything right on the dot. You post every single day. You know, multiple times if you're really awesome, and keep up with everything, and then keep up with every new little tidbit that hits and I found the more that I got you know really chained into trying to get super pro with that stuff you know the less room there was in my mind for creative thinking because let's face it that these are these are little labyrinths of technicality and algorithms and it, there's little mind control games going on for, you know, the poster and the postee and the, the viewer and the poster. And, you know, it, it, it's just in the way that uh, it, I don't mean by the, you know, the way that the things that we say, but by the, the way that the algorithms work and the way that you see feeds and the way that things come up for you. And I do feel like you, you got to be careful because there just isn't any resonant creative or emotional thing there you know there's something for the moment like you can post hey you know here's jeff's new record and i go dang it yes i wanted it i'm so glad i saw that i bought it now it just sold out thank god i just saw it on instagram great great moment on instagram for me but i've often and i still try to think of something <laughs> that ever i saw on social media uh, in the, you know, six or eight years or however long I've been on there that I kind of remember or took, take, you know, I've taken with me like a movie or a poem that I read or anything and, and say, yeah, I've never forgotten that. That's beautiful. It's like a Shakespeare sonnet. It's stuck in my mind since I was three or, you know, five years old and I first heard it. I can't even, I can't remember anything. You know, I can't remember a single thing because it's just this weird, um, you know, it's kind of a disposable thing. And, and, well, it's like toilet paper, basically, and it's there for your needs when you need it, and then you just flush it away when you're done with it. And it's kind of where we are. We're a flushable society. I always, I always end up back in the toilet somehow, but they were a flushable. <laughs> we're a flushable society. I mean, everything we do is to dispose of and to get us through to the next, to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next thing. There's so yeah. little that resonates, and it, it, you're right. A lot of it is just like, hey, I could watch a guy falling down all day i mean i could watch videos of people right, falling right. in pools and stuff like that i find it hilariously entertaining and mindless but right. i'm not really learning anything the thing that we had to do nowadays 
you yourself and, and I too, was to figure out how to make this new medium work for us as older guys in this world where there's new technologies coming in all the time that the kids pick up and get in 30 seconds. I found myself having to educate myself on YouTube and watching how-to videos. Were you going through the same kind of process? Oh yeah, of course. Uh, uh, young, young, <laughs> barely not children or children teach me to do almost everything that I know how to do. <laughs> I've learned in the last five years. Uh, hey, not even, well, you know, it's always whenever you want to something about, you know, tools or like, how do you change a blade on lawnmower? Yeah, you get, you know, someone either my age or older that's like, here's how you do it. You know, some guy in the Midwest in the suburban lawn shows you how to do it. But if you want to know how to do something on Photoshop or <laughs> how to load something onto YouTube to do a podcast, yeah, you're going to get uh, the use of today. And um, so we're even learning about the algorithms and how to use hashtags. I mean, it was always like some wormhole I'd go down with like, oh, I need to have a YouTube channel. Oh, but then you need to be a creator and you need to have this many followers and you need this many hours of watchable and all this stuff. It's like all these different levels of how to be a real creator. It, it, it's, it is mind boggling. And it's so hard to keep track of. I find myself constantly educating myself, which is great because I'm learning. And I think you're doing going through the same process is that we're trying to figure out how to make this new paradigm work for us as a lifestyle, because we don't know when we're going to be back on the road. I don't know when I'm going to be taking pictures again. You don't know when you're going to be taking your guitar out again. So we're, we're working with what we have. Yeah, exactly. And, and try, and you try to figure out, you know, how to be, as colorful and creative and bring as much substance and sincerity as you can to the thing as possible, you know, and maybe, maybe that's not the ideal for, you know, maybe a certain generation, a younger generation might say, Hey, that's not the point. You just, you know, you just post and go on, but I don't know. I can't break from it for me, you know, thing communication long distance started with phone calls and letter writing and, I used to get beautiful letters in the mail when I lived in Europe. I'd get them from friends back over here and they were incredible things. And I look at family letters now and think what a, what a relic this piece is, you know, that I printed out a couple of emails that looked more like letters from someone and kept them. And that works, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to get over that, you know, to try to want communication to be a thing of substance, you know? Well, I, I love being connected with people because a lot of times when you see your friends, you don't have to sit there telling them everything you did. They see your shit on Facebook or on Instagram, and then you can just talk about what you did instead of like, you can get right to the, get, right get to the crux. <laughs> the crux of the biscuit. Yeah, yeah. It's great. All right. So you got the new record coming out. Do we have it? That's 2021 roughly. Um, yeah, probably March or April, you know, so you guys all got together already and recorded it. It's all laid down. Or oh, it's you- done. It's being mastered next. You know, I'll take a listen to that master. Probably give them a few notes, and then they'll they'll do another round, and then we'll send it off for the for the pressing plant to have at it. All right. And do you have shows on the books in the future? I mean, I, I know people had to hold dates in 2021 just so they had some dates because you have to have something. You know, there we have some a, a few pending things like we. We, we canceled right on the brink of COVID um, this wonderful looking tour of Australia with this great band, Endless Boogie, that I love. And I was really looking forward to that. I haven't been to Australia to play or vacation since my earlier band, Comets on Fire, went over there in about 2006 or so. And um, I was really looking forward to it <laughs> and yeah, that went away. So that's kind of pending out there. I mean, I think that, you know, the band and, and the promoter and everybody's sort of, I, you know, I don't know, Jeff. I mean, it just, it's, it's, it's hard to say, but I, I Australia has done very well. They have no cases there now. I mean, it's the place to be, cause they're going to open back up in New Zealand. I think that they got the hot hands in the world because they've beat this thing down. The question yeah. is, will they want us dirty Americans coming over there? No. The yeah. answer is no, they won't. Well, not without a two-week and tracing. I mean, you go to Hawaii now, and they test you when you – you're supposed to test before you get on a plane, and you got to test once you get there. So, 
I mean, people are traveling and doing it and they're testing people. And I guess that's going to be the new paradigm is the testing. And, you know, I, I hate to say that people aren't getting as sick and dying as much as it's a good thing, but we're not seeing the death rate like it was early on with this disease. We definitely have a better way of dealing with it. Hospitals are packed in different places in the United States. I'm not an epidemiologist, but I do want to fucking rage. I'd love to be at a Howl and Rain show soon, yeah, seeing soon. you fucking kick it up. So thank you, Ethan. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate getting a chance to talk to you and hang out. Thanks, Jeff. I had a blast, man. All right, man. Say hi to everybody in Humboldt. Will do. All right. Take Peace. care. Ethan Miller, Howl and Rain. Thanks, Ethan. Thank you. All right. There it is. Great show today. I mean, unbelievable all this talent sitting around but then i wouldn't have anybody to talk to so there's a plus and a minus everybody i got a couple show notes as you know grady's called brew kit oh, oh, oh here it is do you have this in your fridge if not you need to get one if you use this site right here grady's cold slash 420 live you get 20 percent off and uh this comes with enough bags to make a lot of coffee Four bean bags, eight cups of water, and it makes 64 ounces. And then you mix it with water or with milk to make yourself your delicious cold brew drink. My kids are loving it. And you can also do a hot brew on this. has New Orleans chicory in it, so you don't have to add sugar. Grady's, get your own because this one's mine. I'm going to have to fill that up and get it going. You have to use that 420 live code to get the 20% off when you order. So you have to put it in the site just like that. And then sin lawn, it's a sin if you actually are watering your lawn. You're wasting water, folks. Don't waste water. Go to sinlawn.com slash 420 live. Enter their contest and win a five foot by seven foot roll of this. You can put on your deck or you can put in your playroom or wherever and pretend that it's a park. And if you enter with my code, you will be entered to win an 11 by 14. I'm going to pick a winner from the people that enter from 420 live. So get on there sinlawn.com slash 420 live enter the contest to win your roll of four by seven sin lawn and uh i'll throw in a print for you guys just because i love you so much our friends at asher's chocolate another 20 percent off asher's.com asher's chocolate use the 420 live code if you spend 75 dollars you get the, the 420 live cbd bar it's still a thing it's still happening the asher's will put it in your bag with you it is delicious potato chips pretzels raisins Mini M&M's, coconut flakes, chocolate, and CBD. You don't even feel you don't even feel the CBD. It's a beautiful thing. Um, tomorrow we're going down to the Big Easy to see talk to our friends Ben Elman and David Foster down there about the Tip Patina Save Tips event on Saturday. The three hour event. They just added Mike Gordon for Fish. They just added Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails. It's going to be an amazing show. So make sure Saturday you are gearing up tomorrow. And also show note. We are going 420 Live East Coast. <coughs> Got me all choked up. So 420 EST tomorrow, which is 120 Pacific time. It's going to open us up to the European market. I've already booked my first guest. He's not from the EU. He's from Israel. John Schwartz, the general jam, will be coming on next week. He'll be our first international guest calling in from all the way over there in uh in israel in tel aviv so we're excited to have the general jam on we're going to go to prince street pizza on monday and make pizza with dom and his dad and talk to lawrence from off the menu and uh tuesday we got the guys from national in, in national independent theater owners nito are coming on to tell us what we can do to help save our theaters and uh i believe wednesday we're going to talk to steve bloom about the hemp fire cd that's the 25th anniversary of that and thursday with john schwartz so we got a great we just keep on going it's like a snowball going downhill peace love happiness to everybody out there here's the big hug i think i broke your back on that one that was a big squeeze uh thank you all for tuning in you complete me we will see you tomorrow have a great night friday come on